this is a, when Balak calls for Balaam to curse the children of Israel as they come into the land. And God said to Balaam, who are these men with you? And Balaam said to God, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent word to me. Behold, there is a people who come out of Egypt, and they cover the surface of the land. Now come curse them for me. Perhaps I may be able to fight against them and drive them out. And God said to Balaam, Do not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. So Balaam arose in the morning and said to Balak's leaders, Go back to your land, for the Lord has refused to let me go with you. And the leaders of Moab arose and went to Balak and said, Balaam refused to come with us. Then Balak again sent leaders more numerous and more distinguished than the former. And they came to Balaam and said to him, Thus says Balak, the son of Zippor, Let nothing I beg you hinder from coming to me. For I will indeed honor you richly, and I will do whatever you say to me. Please come then and curse this people for and Balaam answered and said to the servants of Balak, Though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not do anything, either small or great, contrary to the command of the Lord. And now, please, you also stay here tonight, and I will find out what else the Lord will speak. Father in heaven, we pray that we will be attentive to your word as we hold it in our hand, as we read it, Father. For we know that your word is life. That your word is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. That it can divide between the soul and the spirit. And we, Father, we pray that our hearts will always be towards you. That we will seek what you would have us to see. That we will be what you would have us to be, Father. That we would do what you expect of us recognize father that we live in a fallen and sinful world and we struggle against the forces of darkness that we struggle against the prince of the power of the air whose goal is to destroy us father we pray that you would be with us as we resist the temptations of this world and of this life we pray that you would guard us that you would direct our steps, Father. Help us to commit our ways to you. We ask for your patience and your mercy and your forgiveness when we stumble, Father. And we pray that you would gently correct us and lift us up as we bring us back to you. Be patient with us and forgive us, we pray in Christ's name. Be the song for the lesson, 484. <clears throat> when the trumpet shall sound, then the dead shall arise, and the immortal shall envelop the sky. When the angel of death shall no longer destroy, and the dead shall awaken, in the morning of joy, in the morning of joy, in the morning of joy, 
will be gathered to glory in the morning of joy. In the morning of joy, in the morning of joy, we'll be gathered to glory in the morning of joy. When the King shall appear in his beauty on high, as to summon his children to the courts of the sky, shall the cause of the Lord have been all your employ, then your soul may be spotless in the morning of joy. In the morning of joy, in the morning of joy, we'll be gathered to glory in the morning of joy. In the morning of joy, in the morning of joy, We'll be gathered to glory in the morning of joy. Oh, the bliss of that morn when our loved ones we meet with the songs of the ransom we suffer shall greet. Singing praise to the Lamb through eternity's years with the past all forgotten with sorrow and tears. In the morning of joy, in the morning of joy, we'll be gathered to glory in the morning of joy. In the morning of joy, in the morning of joy, we'll be gathered to glory in the morning of joy. Psalm 8, Psalm 604. 604. Now, John. <clears throat> Well, I'm very thankful to be with you today. Appreciate your presence. We have folks visiting with us. I want you to know that we're thankful that you're here. I invite you to be back with us anytime you can be here. And uh, we're thankful to God for the opportunity, for the health, and, and the uh, ability to be out to worship Him today. We pray that all that we do will bring glory and honor to Him. The truth about the truth. Well, I uh, appreciate Bo reading from uh, Numbers 22. And we're going to continue thinking about some passages today about God's Word. God's Word is the best commentary on itself. It's also the best instruction manual for how to use it. And so today we're going to begin to discover some of the things that God's Word tells us about itself. I think by knowing these things, it will increase our faith in the Word of God and that we'll, better, we'll know better how to handle the Word of God and we'll be confident that the Word of God can sustain us, we can put all of our hope and trust in it, and we can share it with others. So uh, I invite your attention to look at these passages with me this morning. Um, we're going to begin with Isaiah 55, verses 7 through 9. And uh, let me take a look at that with you real quickly. Isaiah 55, verse 7, where God says through the prophet, Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So this passage introduces us to God's thoughts and ways. And what we find out right away is that God's appeal to us is that we need to forsake our own thoughts and ways. He says to the wicked man, 
forsake your wicked ways. He says to the one with unrighteous thoughts, forsake those unrighteous thoughts and come and see my thoughts and ways and make my thoughts and ways a part of your life. Try to rise to my thoughts and ways. There are some great differences here. He says that his ways are higher. But did you notice how God expressed that? He said, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now, if you try to think about two extremes, can you get any more extreme than the heavens and the earth? I mean, as separated as the heavens are from the earth. Uh, sometimes the Bible uses uh, as far as the east is from the west. Those are extremes, aren't they? And so when God talks about His thoughts and ways as compared to mine, He doesn't just say they're higher. He uses the most extreme way of saying they are higher and appeals to me to make His thoughts and ways my own. Now you think about this in the world that we're living in today. Uh, it wasn't like this when I was a kid, but now people are saying that they have better ways, when it, for example, when it comes to uh, gender identity. People say it doesn't matter how you're born, you, you can be male or female, and then they've come up with all kinds of other gender designations. God only has two, male and female, and He says we're born that way. And God has instructions if you are a man that apply specifically to you. For example, if you want to be an elder in the church, which is also called an overseer, which is also called a pastor. If you want to be, you can go to Titus uh, chapter 1, you can go to 1 Timothy chapter 3, and you can read about the qualifications to be an elder. But guess what one of the number one things is to be an elder? You have got to be a man. Women are disqualified. But then God has instructions for the women also there in 1 Timothy 3. You know? and so older women are to teach the younger women. And... Uh, Women are to love their husbands and love their children. And those things apply specifically to women. And that's God's thoughts and ways. And yet man has wandered off and has evil, wicked thoughts and unrighteous ways. And God implores us, come back to His thoughts and ways. Let His thoughts and ways guide us because... They're not just a little bit higher than ours. They're as extreme as you can get higher than ours. Uh, when it comes to a lot of other things in this life, man thinks he has uh, a better way. But God says, come to my way. So when you think about the truth, God's Word, the number one thing we need to start with is the fact that God's Word, the truth, is so much more than what I possess. So I need to defer to God's thoughts and ways because of who He is and because of what His thoughts and ways can accomplish. Now, continue with me. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 29, where we learn that God's thoughts are higher, but they are still within reach of man. In Deuteronomy 29 and verse 29, God says here, this, Moses says, his servant, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. So secret things belong to God, but revealed things belong to us. We can own those revealed things. They can belong to us. But the secret things we can never own, they belong to God. So when people ask me silly questions like, did Adam have a belly button? I said, I don't know. You have to take that up with God. Because he didn't tell me in his word. And if they, they want to know all these other things that are not revealed, I say, I don't know. The revealed things belong to me, and I can take ownership of them. But the secret things, God owns those. And He alone 
has ownership of those things. But further, we, learn, we don't just learn from this that we can know God's will. But we also learn the purpose of knowing God's will. These revealed things belong to us. We can take ownership of them. Isn't it a wonderful thing that we don't just have this God in heaven who is you know, some abstract being. Uh, we have a God that reveals His Word to us. And He says, here, you can have this. You can own this. It can belong to you. You can know my will. But what's the ultimate purpose for God giving us His will so that we can own it? What's the last part of that verse say? That we may do all the words of this law. We couldn't do God's will without Him revealing it, but once He reveals it, it becomes incumbent upon us to do it. Now that we know it, we must do it. We can't say, well, I didn't know God. I didn't know you wanted me to do that. God will say, I told you. I revealed my will to you. You had access to it. You can read it and know it. So we have no excuse. So um, over in Deuteronomy 29, I want you to, to back up with me uh, to verses 24 and 25, where God says, He's talking about the destruction He brings upon wicked nations. All nations would say, Why has the Lord done so to this land? What does the heat of this great anger mean? Then people would say, Because they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord God of their fathers, which He made with them when He brought them out of the land of Egypt. So when all the people see destruction come upon the land, they say, why does this happen? He says, you tell them, because we didn't do what God told us to do. He revealed His will to us. He let us own it. And we didn't do what He told us to do. And that's why this destruction has come upon us. So the truth about the truth is, though God's ways and thoughts are much higher than man's, we still can reach them. We still can attain them. We can own them and know them and do them. And then I want you to go with me over to Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Notice there, God says, Now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the judgments which I teach you to observe, that you may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers is giving you. You shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take from it that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. Now, here we learn that you're not supposed to add to the word that God commands. Do people do that today? Yes, they do. I'll give you an example. Uh, in the New Testament, in Colossians chapter 3 and Ephesians 6, we're, we're given the example to sing to the Lord. Uh, Galatians 5, 19. Uh, God asks for singing. And so people come along and they say, yes, we'll sing, but we want to add these things to it. We want to add uh, smoke on the stage. And we want to add lights that are flashing. And we want to add some instruments that are playing. And that, that'll just go right along with this singing. Did God ask for that? If God wanted it, don't you think He'd ask for it? And then some religious people will, will say, not only are we going to do this, we want you to do it as well. If you're going to be called by this denominational name, we want you to do that as well. And never to say that people are not to do it. And they've added to what God says. Uh, you, you take, uh, for example, the Roman Catholic Church and look at the pattern of the New Testament church. Do you see bishops and cardinals and people called Father in the New Testament church? You won't see that anywhere in the New Testament except the word bishop as it applies to an elder or a pastor or an overseer of a local congregation, but not in the sense that the Roman Catholic Church uses it. You won't see a cardinal... You won't see a man that you're supposed to call father, and you sure won't see a pope. But they've added to the Word of God, and they expect everyone that wants to be called by the Roman Catholic name to add to as well. Now, God says you don't add to the Word that I command you. You don't add a thing to it. And He also says you don't take from it. 
When the devil came to Eve in the garden, he just added one little word, but that word took from the command of God. He said, as God said, you can't eat of the trees of the garden. And Eve said, oh, God says we can eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he has said, you shall not eat of it, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And the devil said, you shall surely not die. He just added one word. You, and by adding that word, he completely took away from what God said. He took away from the message, you will die. God says, you can't do that. You see what the result of that was, don't you? That has affected humankind for the rest of the time that humankind is on this earth. You see the disastrous results of that. And truly, the only way to do God's will is not to add to it or to take away from it. Over in Acts chapter 2 and uh, verse 38 beginning, notice Peter says to those on the day of Pentecost, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, and as many as the Lord our God will call, and with many other words... He testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Now, who, who told Peter to say that? God told Peter to say it. He didn't add a word to it. He didn't take away from it. And yet today, when people ask, What must I do to be saved? Do they quote the words of Peter, who was an inspired apostle of Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit guiding him what to say? No, they say, Somebody says, What must I do to be saved? And there are so many people today on the radio, on the internet, on the television, in pulpits, everywhere saying to those people that are begging, what must I do to be saved? They say, you just say this prayer. I would challenge you, where in the New Testament? And folks, listen to me good. There is no place. I'm challenging anybody, anybody in this building, anybody that hears this uh, via other media, Anybody that hears me talking right now, show me one place in the pages of the New Testament where a person asked what to do to be saved and they were told to pray. I have searched it, Matthew to Revelation, every page, every word, every letter of every word, and it's just not in there. If it is, you show it to me so that I can straighten my message out. Nobody's told to pray to be saved. Now, would I suggest to somebody to start praying? Absolutely. You better start praying. You better be talking to God about your soul, but you better do more than that. You better do what God tells you to do. Peter told him what to do on the day of Pentecost. <coughs> Why would anyone presume to know better, to add to or to take away? So the point is, Though we're told in Deuteronomy 29 and verse 29 that these things have been revealed so that we can own them. Ownership does not permit us to alter the message in any way. If I gave you the recipe to that delicious pie that Dolores makes, what's that called? Angel pie or something like that? Yeah. If I gave you the recipe to that, but I just added... Uh, a bunch of vanilla to it. Uh, or I just took away from it uh, the nuts that are in it. Would you have Dolores' delicious recipe? No. It wouldn't be. If I change one little thing, if I add to it in one way, if I take away from it in one way, it's not a recipe anymore. And somebody will come to her and say, well, John gave me a recipe and it just didn't come out right. She says, that's not my recipe. What do you think God says when we come to Him with, what must I do to be saved? Just say a prayer. God says, that's not my recipe. I gave you my word. You've added to it. You've taken away from it. And it's not my word anymore. There's no way to have God's word when we alter it. Numbers 22. Let's go to the, the Scripture reading. Now, let's go back to verses 1 through 6. 
you know, Bo could only read so much, so I, I didn't put all this in there. But look, he, he told you the context. Well, here it is. Numbers 22 and verse 1. The children of Israel moved and camped in the plains of Moab on the side of the Jordan across from Jericho. Now Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites, and Moab was exceedingly afraid of the people because they were many, and Moab was sick with dread because of the children of Israel. So Moab said to the elders of Midian, Now this company will lick up everything around us as an ox licks up the grass of the field. And Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of the Moabites at that time. Then he sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Beor, at Pethor, which is near the river in the land of the sons of his people, to call him, saying, Look, a people has come from Egypt. See, they cover the face of the earth and are settling next to me, Therefore, please come at once. Curse this people for me, for they're too mighty for me. <coughs> Perhaps I shall be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land, for I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. There's the context. These people scare me. I want to get rid of them. I know that what you as a prophet of God say comes true, so come here and say what I want you to say. Now, wouldn't that be nice if we could just pick up the Word of God and, and, and hear where it says something that I don't like, I could just redo it. But I can't do that. I can't add to it. I can't take away from it. I can't alter it in any way. But now, this king says, this guy speaks and, and it happens, so this is what I want to happen. Well, let's see how that works out for him. When we go, when we go down to verse 18 that, that Bo read for us earlier, uh, here's the answer. Balaam answered and said to the servants of Balak, Though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. That sounds a lot like adding or taking away from it, doesn't it? So Balaam says... I'm a prophet. God tells me what to say. What about you and I? God tells us what to hear, believe, and say to others, doesn't he? And can we say less or more? No. Balaam couldn't do it, and you and I can't do it. I can't tell you how many times I've wanted to. I've had people come to me in terrible marriages, and they say, can I just get out of this thing? And I read them God's Word. And God's Word says, you know, if one of these people has been unfaithful, God allows it. Has, have one of you been unfaithful? Well, no. I'm sorry. Then what God says you need to do is love each other and forgive each other. Love each other the way God loves His church. And... and, and be true to the covenant that you made with God and find a way. That's what God says. And they were, they're so heartbroken. You know, I, I wish I could say, well, yeah, here I found another exception. And God says, uh, if you don't like the way this person looks in the morning, then you can get rid of them. But I can't do it. All I can say to you is what the Bible says. They, they say, can't you tell us something? All I can tell you is what the Bible says. And if I did tell you something else, would it matter? Because that's what God says. It's His recipe. I can't change it, and even if I do, it's not His anymore. God's not supposed to put His own thoughts. Or pardon me, man is not supposed to put his own thoughts for God's thoughts. And I want you to notice the, the force that Balaam adds to it over in Numbers 24 and verse 13. Look at this and tell me if you see anything a little different. If Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, does that sound familiar? That's what he said in 22.18, isn't it? Exact same thing. I could not go beyond the word of the Lord. Well, does that sound familiar? But that's pretty much word for word what he said in 22.18, right? But then he says, to do good or bad of my own will. He says it's the Lord's will. When the, and then notice the last thing that he says. What the Lord says, that I must speak. Did you hear that? Look at it. 
Let it sink into your brain. What the Lord says that I must speak. Let me tell you, it doesn't matter if it's Balaam or the preacher or an elder or a deacon or an older sister in Christ or anybody in the Lord. Whatever the Lord says, that's what we have to speak. And I don't care how much our spirits are crying out to be able to say something else. It doesn't matter. We can only say what God says. Somebody says, don't, don't you think there's some good people that never confess Jesus that will go to heaven? I, I wish I could turn to God's word and say, yeah, I, I think so. Here, here, you know, God says this and it leads me to believe that. I don't know about that. I'm not a judge of that. That's not my arena. It doesn't matter. But if you're looking for me to say something, all I can say is what's written right here. And that's what Balaam told Balak. And that's what everyone who respects God's word has to say. Truly, the only way to do God's will is to reveal God's thoughts and ways and leave my thoughts and ways out of it. If he gave me his whole house full of silver and gold. Now, who was he talking about? Balak. What was Balak? Balak was the king of the Moabites. How much silver and gold do you reckon he had in his house? A lot. At least Balaam was smart enough to know it doesn't matter how much you give me, it doesn't change what God says. You remember the 30 pieces of silver that Judas took in Matthew 26 and verse 15? Did it change anything? Do you remember him bringing those 30 pieces of silver back? Well, I'm going to tell you, there is no amount of wealth, prestige, lands, anything that we can take to be able to alter the Word of God. Only God's will will do. I want to start with Proverbs 30, verses 5 and 6. Proverbs 30, verses 5 and 6. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in Him. Do not add to His words, lest He rebuke you, and you be found a liar. Man cannot add to God's word and still be acceptable in God's sight. Now, I think we need to realize the import of that. We can't add to God's Word and still be acceptable to Him. Some people might think, well, you know, maybe I shouldn't tell other people to add to God's Word, but if I add to God's Word, you know, he, He's still going to be gracious and merciful to me. I can't add to God's Word and still be acceptable. Here's why. What does Proverbs 30, verses 5 and 6 say about the nature of God's Word? It is P-U-R-E, pure. Let me ask you something. If you have something that's pure and you add something to it, what do you have now? You don't have something pure, do you? It's not pure anymore when you add something to it. It's pure while nothing else is added to it. When we add to God's Word, it's not the pure Word of God anymore. And further than that, look at Psalm 12 and verse 6. Psalm 12 and verse 6. The words of the Lord are pure words like silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. What did, uh, what did this, the soap commercial used to say? 99 and 44, 100% pure. What soap was that? Dove. Ivory. There you go. 99 and 44, 100. I don't know about you, that sounds pretty pure to me. But will that do with God's Word? If, if we have 99 and 44, 100 percent of God's Word, is that close enough? No, because God's Word has been purified seven times. It is the ultimate purification. And if you want to know how that takes place, just think about it. God got His Word to people through fallible, sinful man. And yet, by that pure Word and by God's agency, the pure Word still gets there. Even when I 
who am a fallible, sinful man, when I read to you the exact words, word for word from God's revealed word, you get the pure word, even in spite of me. You know, I think about verses like uh, Matthew chapter 10 and uh, verses 19 and 20. Jesus says, when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak. For it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. So when they spoke, it was God's pure word that came out. God used the, the agency of the Spirit to make sure His word remained pure. And God expects us to keep His word purified seven times over he expects us to keep it pure. And when we add to God's Word, what does it bring? He will rebuke us, Psalm 30, verses 5 and 6, and we will be found a liar. If I told you Dolores' recipe, and I didn't tell you the exact recipe, I'd be lying to you. I mean, I know in this socially acceptable world that we live in today, we don't like to use words like liar. Folks, if you don't tell the truth, you are a liar. <laughs> That's what the Bible says. If I don't tell you the truth, I lied to you. Now, I may have lied to you on purpose or unknowingly, but I still lied to you. And if I lie, there's, de there's terrible consequences for that. If I tell you something from the Word, why do you think my belly is so upset every Sunday morning? <laughs> I mean, I've been doing this for over 20 years. Don't you think I'd get used to it? Nope. <laughs> Because I know when I stand up and talk to you in this building and to whoever else hears this as it goes out all over the world, that I'm, I'm saying this is what God says. Now, folks, that's a big responsibility. I better be able to show you from God's Word that this is what God says. Because if I can't, I am a what? Liar. Now, if I'm not giving you the pure Word of God and I'm a liar... What's going to happen? Revelation 21 and verse 8. The cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. If I lie... I can expect hell as my eternal destination. If I'm not forgiven by the blood of Jesus for my lie, and I'm guilty of being a liar, hell will be my eternal destination. That's what the Bible says, and there you have it, black and white. And uh, over in uh, Revelation 22, in verse 18, you can see, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to them the plagues that are written in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of the prophecy, God will take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. If I don't give you God's pure word, if I don't accept God's pure word, I have altered God's pure word. It brings rebuke. I'm called a liar. And there are terrible, terrible consequences for that. And last point I want to make today I'd like to continue this next week, Lord willing, is it's never acceptable to think of any man more than God's Word. I think I've probably told you all this story, but I haven't told you today. Uh, I, I had this Bible study with someone here in our community, and they told me something I had never heard before. I'm not going to go into what they told me. It was one of the craziest things I ever heard. And, and I knew it was wrong because I'd read the Bible. And so I took the Bible and I said, here, I want you to read this. And uh, <clears throat> the person told me, I can't read it. I can't see very well. I said, well, will you let me read it to you? Yeah, read it to me. And so I opened the page and I kept it in front of them so they knew I was reading from the book. And I read the Word of God to that person. And when I got done, I said, so what do you think about that? And this person said, well, I've been listening to this fella on the TV for almost 20 years. And what I believe is what he says. And I've only just met you. And even though you've read that to me from the Bible, 
I choose to believe that guy. I've got confidence in him. Needless to say, our Bible study was over. Because when he chose the word of the man on TV over the word of God, I had nothing left to offer. And I politely saw myself out. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, there are two great men, two great men that are mentioned. Paul says, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will bring, both, bring to light uh, the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. Then each one's praise will come from God. Now listen to him. Now these things, brethren, I figuratively transferred to myself. Who's speaking? The Apostle Paul. And Apollos, the Apostle Paul and Apollos. Do you know any finer guys in the New Testament? I don't, other than Jesus Christ himself. These were fine men that did incredible work in the kingdom of God. And he says, I've transferred these things to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us, in Paul and Apollos, not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. Where does Paul say the buck stops? With the written word. He says, I don't care if I say something or Apollos, you don't put us above the written word of God. Do you think there's people that put Billy Graham above the written word of God? Maybe Franklin Graham now. Maybe that hot shot out in Texas, uh, Osteen. Uh, and a lot of other men. That they say, well, I know the Bible says that, but th this guy says this, and I'm going to listen. And, I wanna, and one of the main reasons I'm saying this is, I don't ever want you to listen to me above what you read in here. If I say anything that goes one iota above or below what this says, you tell me to get lost. You don't listen to me. You send me on my way. If Paul and Apollos were not fit to be put above the written word of God, nobody is. And Paul says, that's why I wrote this. It's never acceptable, never acceptable to think more of a man than God's word. Never. I don't care who the man is. What is written is all that matters. And to put men above what is written, Paul says, is the height of of carnality. If you look over at 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verses 3 and 4, Paul says, You are still carnal, for where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Carnal means fleshly. It means having to do with temporal things. Do you think that People that are described as fleshly, temporal, animal type people will inherit the kingdom of heaven. No. We're to be spiritual people. We are to have on our minds and in our hearts the things of the spirit, not of the flesh. It's never acceptable to think more of a man than of God's word. You know, Proverbs 23 and verse 23 says, Buy the truth and do not sell it. Also, wisdom and instruction and understanding. Well, here's the truth about the truth. God gives it, and then He expects it to be upheld as His truth. We can't change it, and we can't take someone else's word over it, and we've got to treat it as the holy word of God and never stray from it. If you talk to somebody about God's word, it had better be God's word. And folks, if we don't, God calls us a liar. He rebukes us. And he says, if I don't straighten it out, eternal torment is my destiny. We are so blessed to have the truth. Do you realize that? To have in our possession God's word, whether it's in a book form or on our phones or our tablets or on our computers or however we're getting it. We have in our possession, we own God's Word. Not that we can change it, but we can own it. And we're so blessed. But let's make sure we show God our appreciation 
by keeping it, his word. Uh, if you're here today and, and, and you've not rendered obedience to God's word, God says through his word, confess your faith in Jesus. Romans 10, 9 and 10. He says, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sins. Mark 16 and verse 16 and Acts 2 and verse 38. That's God's word. And if you haven't done that, everything is ready right now that you can do that today. And if, if there's a brother or sister in Christ and you realize that you have not treated God's word with the respect that it's due. And there are things in your life that need to be made right. If you, if you would like prayers on your behalf or, or, or you just want to talk about those things, and we stand ready to do that. Uh, if there's any way that we can help you, let us know right now while we stand and sing. Amen.